<laughs> I've never had Bellflower mentioned in an intro before, so thank you for that. There's a commercial that's been running in LA for decades, and it mentions uh, Bellflower at the end of it. So if you live in the area, this is ingrained in your head forever. Um, thank you so much to Lisa Petrides and everyone at uh, Big Ideas. And Liz, thank you for the great intro. <clears throat> um, I'm a documentary filmmaker. That's my job. Um, but to be clear, I have made several documentaries in the education sphere. And to be clear, the most important job in the world, I think, is being a teacher. So I am full of great admiration for all of the teachers and educators out there. Um, I do my best to mentor when I can, but I am in awe of what you do. And please keep it up, because it is the single most important job in the world. Um, a few years ago, I was making a very short film. So short, in fact, it was five minutes long. And this was a challenge for me to make a film that was only five minutes long. And it was for a new nonprofit that launched that some of you may have heard. Um, it's called Code.org. So the founders of Code.org came to me and they said, we want to make a movie. And in the movie, we want to teach people how to code. What do you think? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know if that's a full movie, but you know, maybe we could make something shorter. And we kept getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And we thought it was going to be 10 minutes. And then it was going to be five minutes. And I'll just tell you a, a quick story about that. When Hadi and Ali Partovi uh, wanted to do this, we, we made a list of all the rock stars of code, right? So I interviewed the founder of Facebook, the founder of Twitter, the founder of Dropbox, the founder of Microsoft, you know, all men. And I kept saying, where are the women? You know, we have to, we have to find these women, and, and they existed, but in much, much smaller numbers. And that was kind of a revelation for me. So we went on. We made this film about coding. We thought, OK, maybe, maybe if we're lucky and we do outreach all across the US, maybe 10,000 people will watch this little film. And they'll learn about code.org. And they will ask their students to take coding lessons. So we launched two days after the Oscars. And I remember putting our video online and the video of the day was, do you guys remember when Jennifer Lawrence tripped up the stairs to accept her award? And I was like, wow, Jennifer Lawrence is like trips up the stairs and she has 4 million views. You know, and we're hoping that we get you know, 10,000. Let's, let's see what happens. So we got very lucky. And Mark Zuckerberg put it on his Facebook page, although those views don't count on YouTube. right? Jack Dorsey put it on Twitter. Uh, Drew Houston, the founder of Dropbox, you know, put it in his Dropbox and made it available. And all of a sudden, all these people started saying, you have to watch this film about computer programming, right? And in the first day, we had a million views. And we thought, victory, this is fantastic. We can all go home now. Wake up the next morning, 4 million views. I go to YouTube, and we're 300,000 views behind Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> And I'm like, OK, what has my life come to? I sat there on the computer, hitting refresh, every once in a while doing something else, trying to beat her. And finally, we blew past her and had 30 million views. <laughs> so I tell you this not to boast. I'm forgetting my notes. Um, but to share that you never know. You know, my first documentary was about a former vice president talking about global warming and making a slideshow. And that, that turned into something, you know? And so you never know. You might have this grain of an idea. And you might think, well, who's going to watch this film about this thing that's very cut and dry? But you never know what you're going to end up with. Um, so while I was making Code.org, and I had this revelation about where are all the women, I had a couple days left to shoot. And I said, I need to find a classroom where young girls are learning how to code. And I sent emails to everybody I knew in the tech space. And I was turned on to this group called Iridescent. And I went and filmed this classroom. And little second and third graders were like looking at their computer and screaming when they made it do something. And it's like little light bulbs went off. And I thought, gosh, this is so fantastic. And when I was there, I heard people talk about this contest they had called Technovation. And Tara Chaklovsky told you about that earlier today. 
So the contest was really unusual. To recap, high school age girls from around the world are given three months to design a mobile app. Something every high school girl has is a phone, right? And if you say to them, find a problem in your community and figure out how you can put an app on your phone to solve it, you suddenly have their attention. So together, they build a mobile app from idea to implementation. Um, so it starts with identifying a problem, and it ends with a business pitch for a solution. I thought this was the coolest thing. First of all, I'd never heard of a contest just for girls. And I thought this was the coolest thing I'd ever heard. I went running around to everybody I knew, and I'm like, this is my next film. I don't know what it's called, but it's my next film. So I have to follow this contest. The only problem is it starts in January, and it ends in July. And there are girls from like 30 countries that enter, so I'm probably going to follow some teams and we're going to fall in love with them and poof, they're not going to make regionals. And then I'm going to follow another team and then poof, they're not going to make semifinals. So my editor compared it to um, Game of Thrones because you fall in love with these characters and then they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> so Technovation is a technology and entrepreneur comp competition for girls. So the girls work closely with female technology entrepreneurs and advisors, making it easier for them to imagine a similar future. We hear this a lot. You can't be what you can't see, right? Men are now allowed to coach and mentor. So but there's that as well. Um, so the girls define a problem. They brainstorm solutions. They create user-centered designs, conduct market research and competitive analysis. They learn to code. They brand and promote their application. They investigate uh, potential revenue sources and streams, and they pitch their ideas to other, others, all while going to high school. I shot in places as far flung as little villages in Moldova, and it's not just in North America that high school girls are overscheduled. Yet they were so energized by someone coming to them and saying, hey, find a problem and then tell me how you would solve it, that they did it. In addition to everything else, they did it. I think we all worry about how pervasive technology is in our lives. And while there are both, both positives and negatives, it truly really frightens me that 51% of the population is often left out of the design process, I'm talking about girls and women, and its decision-making process. This will have long-term consequences if it doesn't change, economically, politically, and socially. Many of the strides we've made towards gender equality could be unintentionally reversed by accident of design. So this contest was a way for me as a filmmaker to show just how empowered girls become when they are exposed to code and they start to think like entrepreneurs. Many of the amazing girls I met talked about how they were transformed by doing this. Um, for some, it was just as simple as having more confidence. For others, learning to code somehow made learning French easier. Um, it, it helped them in their other classes because they were more logical thinkers. One girl said, I was walking down the street and I stopped because I never thought about, did I put my left foot first or my right foot first and why did I do that and then when did I use my next foot and, 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 and why am I thinking this way? Um, many of the girls never would have tried coding if it weren't for this contest. And you get to experience this a lot as teachers, but as a filmmaker, I don't get to see this a lot. And when I watched this girl teach her computer how to talk back to her, and the first time it worked, and she was 17 years old, and she starts running around the room like, like it was this miracle. It's really amazing to see. Um, I want to take a moment to digress. Yes, I have a moment. To talk about groups and labels, um, in the age of the hashtag economy, that is, economy of words and thoughts, we are often too quick to label. While often good for efficiency, sometimes confining everything to a simple label, a group, or a 120 character thought bubble, it can limit people in unexpected ways and have unexpected consequences. Uh, I saw a documentary recently where these girls entered high school and they lived in fear every day of accidentally committing to the wrong group, not realizing they could change their group, that whoever they sat with that day at lunch, they were permanently going to have to sit with. And, and I thought, gosh, that's strange. And then the next week, my closest friend called me, and her son John was starting high school. And she said he came home crying. And this is like a tough athlete, popular kid. I'm like, why? And she goes, well, I find out he's been sitting in the, lunch, in the library during lunch every day eating by himself because he didn't want to make the wrong decision and join the wrong group. And 
to me, I think there are 14-year-olds approaching high school as if they were strategizing for battle. And this was a revelation to me. Instead of going in with open minds, ready to try new things, they were thinking, OK, I'm going to be this, and then I can't be this, and then I can't do this. So for the teens here in the room, I can tell you that after filming all over the world for Code Girl, every single girl had to leave her label, track star, soccer champ, popular girl, loner, to form a new team for the contest. And it was fine. You can navigate and try new groups and new ideas. You have more power than you think in high school. If you don't like things at your school, in the world, in politics, then change them. As teens, you don't have a lot of power. This is one way to get it. You don't like that you have to deal with attendance every day? Well, then write an app to automate it. You don't like how you can choose your classes and come up with another new way. There's so many things that you can do. School is a time to try on personas, learn new philosophies, and put yourself in someone else's worldview so you can have greater understanding of yourself and thus the rest of the world. It's not a time to fear a label or worse, that the label might be permanent. This seems obvious, but in the age of the hashtag, it isn't. Great thinkers don't come from staying in your own filter bubble. Now more than ever, we need to respect, or sorry, we need to reject the negativity that can come from a restricted label. Kids should be free to be code girls one week, athletes another, vegetarians the next, an artist the next, a businesswoman, a techie, whatever they want. Some of the things the girls said while making Code Girl stayed with me for a long time. Melissa from Winchester, Massachusetts said, this is where I got the quote from earlier, at 15, no one has ever asked me to identify a problem in my community and come up with a way to solve it. Sloan said, I look around and see problems at my school, and I walk around campus, and I say, how can I solve that? What can I build to solve that? How can I join and make a difference? So I followed this whole contest from January to July. Now, when you make a documentary film, you do your best to make these plans. And you're like, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this, and this team is going to make it to finals because their app is just so amazing. So you spend all the time with them, and then, like I said, they go away. So imagine finding these great characters with the best apps ever, or so I thought, and they keep disappearing. And then I meet new people, and I follow them. And then finally, we're down to six finalists three from the US and three from other countries. And a, oh no, yellow flag already. Um, and a couple days, we know what? I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to see the film. <laughs> <laughs> so one quick thing I want to tell you very quickly is that I learned from these girls. When it came time to release the film, I was talking to a regular big name distributor, and they're like, we're going to try and go to Sundance, and then we're going to go to all these festivals, and then we're going to do this, and we're going to have these taste-making groups, and all of this. And I thought, what high school girls are going to Sundance in January? You know? And I was talking to someone earlier, and as a documentary filmmaker, you want to say, everyone wants to see my film. My audience is everyone, right? But I knew my audience was teenagers. And what do teenagers watch? They watch YouTube. So I went to my investors and I said, hey, what do you think, would you mind, what do you think, uh, I'm going to give away the film for free. <laughs> it's a great idea, right? And they're like, well, what? what? And I'm like, oh, I'll just do it for five days and we'll, we'll try and get to like 5,000 views or something. Then we'll go to movie theaters. Then we'll go to TV in, in production. It's called windowing. You know, you have a window here and a window here and then a window there. So Google had an organization called Made With Code. And I called them up and I said, hey, has anyone shown their movie on YouTube first and then gone to theaters and TV and Netflix and everywhere else? And they said, no, actually, that hasn't been done. It has now, a year later, but it hadn't been done at that time. So November 1st of last year, we put the movie up on YouTube in four languages, in English, Hindi, Portuguese, and Spanish. And there's this handy little thing on YouTube when you use your own page called analytics. So while we got a million views in five days, movie length, which was a real surprise, I know 89,000 teen girls, and that's computers registered to teen girls, watched the film. There could have been two of them. There could have been 10 of them. There were coding parties all over. So I learned from these girls. I never would have thought of this. But I was like, what technology can I use to reach them? And so that's why we had that narrow focus. Next month, Technovation 2017 starts. 
And I'm just a filmmaker, and while I count myself as a hashtag code girl, among other labels, I'm not officially in the field of education, but you guys are. So please check out, go to technovationchallenge.org. If you can be a coach or a mentor, I can't think of many endeavors more worthy of your support. And to leave you with a few statistics, some of you may know these, some of you may not. In 2014, just 14.7% 14 of computer science graduates were women. 7% of technology companies are founded by women. By the way, this closely parallels how many female directors there are in the film industry. While 57% of all bachelor's degrees are earned by women, just 12% of computer science degrees are awarded to women. Remember, girls and boys do not differ significantly in their abilities in mathematics and science, but they do differ in their confidence and interest. So we can help change that. Code Girl is about many things. Empowering girls through technology is one of them. Busting stereotypes is another. It's not just for geniuses, it's not something you do alone, and it's not just for boys. Right now, we have to think of ways to break through all the noise, all the fake news, to deliver important messages. For me, it was to show other teens how exciting computer science can be. Thanks, and come see the film if you can.